put up a deal, a signed deal. Hmm? Firmed up. They said, here's the deal. We want to go to your religion, and then you can have our daughters, and you, we'll take your daughters, and we'll give you our sheep and our land and everything. The Jews said, no, you can't do that because you're not really from us. They said, well, what's it going to take? They made powwow or mashura. They came back and said, okay, here's what we'll do. You have to make khatan, which is uh, circumcision on the private part, okay? And then well, you can be our brothers. This is all in their Bible, by the way. All of this is in the Bible. Any copy, go get it and read it. So they did. They said these tribes went and they did that. They, all of them, thousands of them. And they said on the third day, when they were so sore, they couldn't even get up. You know? Okay? They said then they went in and killed all of them. It's in their Bible. They killed them and took their women. They killed everybody. They turned their children into slaves, raped their women, and destroyed all of their animals. Yes. So we see people have been doing these kind of things for a long time. Now the reason for taking them to this chapter of the Bible really was because I wanted them to see that their book has something much stronger and very hateful in it. By the way, it does end the chapter. It says that Jacob did not approve of it. Didn't like it. And I'm sure he didn't, if it even happened. So now when we come to the Quran, and the Quran has something in it, because sometimes they'll just come up to me and say, or like emails you get, how come your book says you have to kill all the Christians and the Jews? Hmm? And you say, that don't have anything. No, no, no. We saw it on the internet. It said, kill all the Christians and Jews wherever you can find them. How many of you heard something about this? Anybody heard about what I'm talking about? You heard about it, right? Some Muslims think that's true. But that's misquoting it really big time. Big time. But what was it really about? What really happened, and we're going to take this because you're accusing the Quran of saying it. What it says in here is that they were forbidden actually to participate in any type of thing like this until a certain time came. Because it talks about in the beginning for them to learn about Allah. And they spent a lot of years studying and learning how to obey God on His terms and what He wants from us. They had to give up drinking. Alcohol became forbidden. They never knew that until the Quran came. No alcohol. Whoa. But it came in stages. First, just don't drink it while you're praying. You know, no drunks praying. Well, that makes sense. And then, all of a sudden, no more drinking. It also commanded them in here, no more sex outside of marriage. You have to be married. Otherwise, big problem for you. So, no sex outside of marriage. By the way, now on another program, maybe we'll talk about women or something like that. And I'll come into it. But when you're talking about the women, this is a big subject. When they start to say the Prophet Sallallahu is some kind of a sex offender, Audhu Billah, and they say horrible words that I'm not going to use here or anywhere when I talk about our beloved Prophet Sallallahu But, just so you'll know, I want you to think about it. I don't want to leave the subject before I mention this. The Prophet Sallallahu cannot be accused of something like that. You know why? Well, isn't it true that he got married when he was 25 years old? He never had sex with any girl ever. And by the way, for the clarification of the Americans, we have to say, or a boy, because they don't know, you know about this. Huh? So he never had sex, period, till he was 25 years old. Zero. Right or wrong? When a boy is most interested in that subject, it's not age 25. It starts somewhere around 12 to 17, and that's what the doctors tell us. That's the scientists telling us that. Okay? Every man here knows about his own hormones. I won't get into that. But you understand exactly what we're talking about. At 25, the man has calmed down a lot. He spent the next 25 more years, am I right? Married to Khadija. And during that 25 years that he was married to her, he never ever had sex with any other woman. And again, for the people in San Francisco or men. Didn't do it. Totally Totally one woman for 50 years. Now, how are you going to tell me that after that, all of a sudden, that he went out here and did what? Excuse me. Come on. 
Come on, let's look at it closer. We can break that one down in the, one of the other sessions. But now I'm going to come back to the terrorism thing. There is a passage in the Quran that says, and kill them. Absolutely says that. That is what it says in Arabic. It uses the word kital, yukatilu. It says it, and it means to kill. But in what sense of the word? Unfortunately, some of the translators got really excited, and this is about 70 years ago, and they used the word slaughter. That's not very good. That was not a good choice of words. Because today, people, when you say slaughter, they think you're going to do like the biha on somebody. Especially when they're talking about Muslims are cutting off heads and all the rest of it. It's scary. What kind of religion do you have? And I understand their trepidation. I had the same problem. This affected me the same way. But then I came to know that this is not Islam. It has nothing to do with Islam, as we're going to see in a minute. For those 10 or 13 years that the Muslims were enduring a lot of oppression from their own relatives and families, their own tribes, who were coming up against them and attacking them and abusing them, even physically, they were not responding back any more than just simple self-defense. They never organized any kind of a combat against them. Now, underline this word, combat. Did you hear me? Combat. I want you to use that word when you're talking because we're going to come back to it. Okay? Now, what happened was after the Muslims had been put out, they had sanctions against them, they were outside of their territory, they, nobody could go out to where they were, I forget what you, exiled, like exiled out of their own uh, property, put out, left to die out in the valley for a couple of years, long time. They made a migration to Medina. And when they were there, then they became reinforced. And then a verse comes. Okay? But it tells them to go make Hajj. Go read it. It's in Surah Baqarah 189. Telling about Hajj, that the months are known to you. The moon, the months, this is what you go by lunar calendar. This is time for your Hajj. That's what it says. Unless somebody changed it. They didn't change it in 1,400 years. I'll just check it right now. I can remember the Bibles that I used to pick up when I was preaching. I would pick one up and I'd go, oh, set it down, pick up another one. This is the wrong one. <laughs> There's a beautiful thing about Arabic and the Quran. It doesn't change. Yeah, here's what it says. They ask you, Muhammad, about the new moons. Say, these are signs to mark the first periods of time for mankind and for the pilgrimage, the Hajj, it's not Albir that you enter the houses by, by the back, but, Allah, but Albir is that you fear Allah. It's a taqwa for Allah. So enter your houses through the proper doors, fear Allah that you'll be successful. Wa, katilu. The word is wa. What is wa? That's and. Nobody begins a sentence with and. You ever have me walk up and you say, and the bus shall be here in about no. They don't say and, they say the bus will be here. Huh? Or they'll say when will the bus be, but and when will the bus be here? Nobody talks like that. So likewise, Allah didn't talk like this. He doesn't say just wa, unless it's like wal asr, in that case it's a swearing by something. But it says, wa katilu, fisa bilillah. So do kital for the sake of Allah. I'm going to leave it in Arabic for you for a minute, Now I want you to think about it. Those who do kital to you, but don't transgress the limits. What did I tell you earlier? Islam is about rights and limits. Rights, yes, but limits. And here it comes. Don't transgress the limits. And do kat, uh, katilu, do kital to them wherever you find them and turn them out from wherever they turned you out. And al fitna is worse than kital. And don't do kital with them at the Masjid al-Haram, the place of making the pilgrimage, unless they first attack you there. But if they kital you, then kital them. Such is the payback for the disbelievers. But if they cease, then Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. And kital them until there's no more fitna. And worship is for Allah alone. But if they stop, then let there be no transgression against the volimun, the polythists or wrongdoers. I, again, I repeat, I left it in Arabic for a reason. Because if you start trying to play with this and use different words to have variety in English, you're going to get in trouble. 
And you'll say things like kill, slaughter, maim, destroy, stuff. And would, and this is not really the essence of what's being said, inshallah. Because if you understood it, as I understood it, the Muslims have been turned out of their own property, of their own homes, their own na land and nation, yes or no? You, everybody with me? Everybody's still awake? Am I boring you? Okay. So, here's what we're saying. When Islam came to these Arabs, it didn't come to teach them how to fight and kill people. They already knew how to do that. Think. Remember before Islam came, they had a 40-year feud, a war between tribes over a camel race. Is yes or no? A camel won the race. One of the other tribes threw a rock, killed the camel. They killed the boy. They killed that boy. They killed this one back and forth. Forty years go by and they're killing, killing, killing over what? A camel race. You don't have to teach Arabs how to fight. They're born with a rock in their hand. They know how to do it. What Allah did was to take time to let them learn how not to fight so that you can find the balance between rights and limitations. So he gave them the limit first. Huh? And they were very patient. Very patient. They had to be patient. The Prophet ﷺ wasn't going to let them be any other way. They had to hold back, hold back, hold back. And then the order came. Okay. Now, Yukatilu. What is Kital? I'm going to translate it as mortal combat. Mortal combat. Because you have to translate to a word that's in use today that people know how to use it and how it works. Mortal combat. Meaning I've got to be willing to kill and be killed for the sake of what? To stop al fitna. What is fitna? Now we could go back and read the verses again and you'd see how the combat fits right in there. Do combat with them because they did combat with you. Stop the combat if they stop the combat with you. You see how that works all the way to the end. But then at the end, it, it says, and continue the kital uh, until the way can be established for Allah. And some of them said this means until they submit and become Muslims. Even, even Muslim translators said it. And it's wrong because that would negate another beautiful verse in the same surah. La ikraha fi deen. And Allah doesn't compel anybody to submit to Him. That's what you got a life for. It's always going to be your choice. But what it does, it establishes it so that there's a way for people to come to Allah. The door is open. You don't have to, but at least there has to be some kind of a setting where people can know about what's Islam and know about Allah and then be able to come to Him. It has to be their choice. That's all it's talking about. So we've solved all but one thing. What's fetna? Fitna is when things are so bad that, that Islam can't spread. It's so bad when you can't do anything. It's like really the worst. It's like what you say in Texas. It's kind of like falling down in a rolled up barbed wire fence. It's fitna. So when you see aggression and oppression, and when you see the big guys coming down on the, bad, on the little guys and doing bad things to them, innocent women, children, elders being attacked, being killed, people being thrown out of their homes, being run over by bulldozers or whatever, then this is what? Fitna. Now in English, the best word to call that is what Mr. Bush calls it. Terrorism. So fight them until the terrorism is over. With what? Limitations of combat. Within God's limitations. Make sense? So who declared the war on terrorism? Mr. Bush? No, he only repeated. And he, at the same time, by the way, when he said this on Thursday night, two days after 9-11, stood on the White House lawn, made the announcement, told everybody that he's declaring a war against terrorism, he said in the same speech, Islam is a peaceful for religion. Well, that's a very nice thing, and we support him in that. And we support a war against terrorism because we've got the eyes for it right here. In fact, if he'd like to make shahada, we'd like to accept it. That'll be two guys from Texas. How about that? All right. Now, 1,400 years ago, Allah told us the rules and regulations, the rights and limits for combat. And that's what it was talking about. But it's important for Muslims not to sidestep the issue. Don't say Islam is peace. 
And all we want is peace and there's no fighting in Islam unless it's self-defense because that's not true. Just as Mr. Bush ordered the people...